This is video number two for elasticity, high Debra number measurements, part one, for polymer rheology and processing. So first we talked about kind of a review of what solid behavior is, and then we gave the example of vulcanized rubber. So we're going to go further and talk about other macromolecular solids. There are many other solids, first of all, that are not macromolecular. Um, however, we're not going to really consider those. Uh, in the text that you have, um, there are a variety of examples of non-macromolecular solids. But since our course is called Polymeric Rheology and Processing, we're going to talk about just the macromolecular solids from this point. Macromolecular solids include a variety of materials. Uh, these include natural materials like wood, teeth, opals, and of course a variety of synthetic materials like rubbers and composite materials. We will look at the following. Uh, we're going to look at some polymers in different scenarios and we'll look at filled polymer networks or particulate systems. There are three relevant situations that we're going to talk about. Uh, solid polymers formed from the melt, uh, and this is typical for uh, solid pellets that are used in extrusion type processes. We'll also talk about compliant elastomers that come to mind when we talk about rubber elasticity. And then we'll also talk about polymer gels formed in polymer solutions. In each case, the physical chemistry of the macromolecules is crucial to understand the structure that then impacts the rheological behavior. We will focus on organic macromolecules. Uh, there are some inorganic macromolecules, but we won't focus on those. The majority of them are organic, so we will focus on the rheology of these. And it's these organic macromolecules that are often chosen because of their rheological behavior, and that's their main reason for their utilization and end applications, whatever they may be. So, an organic macromolecule is a polymer backbone that is, consists of carbon chains. These are generally single bonds. Uh, however, there may be a, num a significant number of double bonds in a variety of different types of arrangements, like uh, fennel rings and things like that. Side groups or side chains are key features. These control rotation around the bonds of the backbone, uh, and bond rotation contributes to the rigidity or the flexibility of that polymer molecule. The covalent carbon-carbon bond is rigid, and the bond angle is fixed, and that we know. And since many bonds make up that backbone, rotation allows many coil shapes to form, and they can easily change conformation from one to another. The ease of this conformational change results in systems that are more compliant in shear and extension than other types of solids. And so, once again, we're going to review Poisson's ratio. In this case, Poisson's ratio is close to 0.5. Uh, and we can see uh, from this modified equation for bulk rigidity modulus that the modulus could be quite large for a macromolecular situation. Polymer chain conformation is something that we really do have to consider. It is important to review how isolated polymer chains behave. And this will provide a picture of the size and shape of a polymer for us. And a polymer chain in a vacuum, for example, will collapse into a dense unit. Uh, a polymer chain in solution, however, will take on a conformation that is a function of the interaction with surrounding molecules. And the balance between the entropically driven tendency to maximize spatial conformation and the connectivity of the polymer units has a big effect on that conformation. And this is the case whether the chain is surrounded by small solvent molecules or other very large macromolecules that act as their solvent, like a polymer in the melt. So, in the case of a dilute polymer solution, the chains are very separated and they take up a coil-like conformation. The coil is not static, uh, and on average its shape is more like an ellipsoid, ellipsoidal shape. Rotation around the chemical bonds that link the monomer units allow for many different chain conformations. And so the simplest model for us to consider for a polymer chain in a 3D situation is a random walk, so to speak. And that random walk it has fixed step lengths and is shown by this figure here. So, fixed step length with in 3D showing equal magnitude steps R1 to R11. And the end to end vector here is R. The important parameter to characterize is the magnitude of the vector from atom 0 to atom 11. And this is shown again by that vector R. R is the sum of the, all of the original bond vectors, and we must calculate an average value of this end to end length. There are as many bonds going to the right, positive, as going to the left, negative. And if we put those all together, that would give us a mean value of about zero. 
but we can solve this by taking the square root of each of these and then taking the square taking the square and then taking the square root of the average value and we define the end to end dimension as the root mean square of n bonds of length b as represented by this relationship here in real polymer chains you have fixed bond angles and they, each of these atoms occupies a physical volume. So it means that a true random walk can't exactly happen because the random walk cannot cross itself. Um, and it's more open than a simple model. So then you have C infinity is the characteristic ratio that produces this expansion, which is shown here. So the root mean square equals C infinity times N times B. And so the C infinity B squared is the effective bond length in a real polymer chain. So for the case of just bond angle restriction, you get this relationship where theta is the bond angle. And in this case, the tetrahedral, head, tetrahedral angle is 180 minus 109.5, and C infinity is 2. This characteristic ratio describes coil expansion due to constraints on the random walk that include the fixed bond angles, restricted rotation due to bulky side groups, and it kind of excludes volume effects. So there are various different ways to determine experimentally the coil size, and these include viscosity, light scattering, and neutron scattering. And what you actually determine in this case is the radius of gyration, or RG. RG is an average distance of each atom from the center of the mass of the coil, and it is related to the root mean square dimension, such as this. So here you have the root mean square relationship that we saw before. Radius of gyration is the root mean square divided by the square root of 6. These are the characteristic ratios for typical polymers in dilute solution. So a polymer for unhindered rotation has a C infinity value of 2. When you look at polyethylene oxide, it has a C infinity value of 3.4. Polyethylene oxide is very flexible because of the oxygen in the backbone. When you look at cellulosic, you get a C infinity of 8. These are much more rigid. And then polystyrene has these bulky side groups. So as the number goes up, you start to see a C infinity value that is much higher. In other words, the rotation becomes more and more hindered. So, in talking about polymer cane chain confirmation, we have considered the following factors. The chemical architecture and the statistics of a random walk. There are other very important factors. One is the chemical environment of the chain, uh, the solvent that the chain happens to be in, and the temperature of that system. The chemical environment, when we're talking about it, focus on the interaction energies between molecules, specifically the free energy of interaction between a solvent molecule and a chain segment. And this is compared to an interaction between two chain segments or an interaction between two solvent molecules. And this is where Flory-Huggins theory comes in. This takes into account the entropy, which is calculated from the number of solvent chain segment interactions, and the enthalpy, which is calculated from difference in interaction energy between various combinations of chain segments and solvent interaction. This just gives us the free energy of mixing as represented here. So you have the free energy of mixing equals the Boltzmann's constant times the temperature times these terms here. And N sub I is the number of sites per volume occupied by solvent. I equals 1 or polymer, I equals 2. And the natural log is the relative volume. The first two terms in Flory Huggins theory refers to the number of ways that a solvent polymer can be arranged. And these 1 and 2 terms, so 1 and 2, are the entropic contribution. The third term accounts for the free energy of contact between the polymer and the solvent. And this uh, term here, number 3, is the enthalpic contribution. We, here we have chi, and chi is defined as um, the enthalpy of mixing over this term, where we have the Boltzmann's constant and temperature and the particular uh, interaction between solvent and polymer. Once we have free energy of mixing, we can estimate the osmotic pressure for a dilute solution shown here, where R is, R is the gas constant, and V sub I is the molar volume of the polymer or solvent, and then concentration is in mass per unit volume. When chi equals 0.5, we have conditions that describe osmotic pressure of an ideal polymer solution. 
The temperature solvent condition that yields this result is known as the theta condition. So for example, the theta temperature for polystyrene and cyclohexane is about 101 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.4 Celsius. And this is where the polystyrene molecule is closest to random coil conformation because it's unperturbed by solvent effects. When chi is greater than 0.5, we have a poor solvent and the coil will collapse. When chi is less than 0.5, we have a good solvent and the coil will expand to pack as many solvent molecules around that chain as possible. And the theta condition is often used when determining molecular weight by concentration dependence of viscosity. So viscosity is uh, molecular weight. So concentration of polymers in solution. When we're talk we were, at this point, we've talked about dilute polymer solutions. Polymer molecules can move around independently of each other. They have a lot of volume available, and it's in excess of the excluded volume of the molecule. When we're talking about semi-dilute, there are too many polymers in solution to be in excess of that excluded volume. So they can see each other and then you get a concentration known as C star. And C star is the concentration at which the volumes of the coils just occupy the total volume of the system. And it's represented by this relationship here. In this case, N sub A is Avogadro's number. At concentrators greater than C star, there'll be polymer chains at any position in the solution. There'll be large fluctuations in local concentration with position. The density of each polymer coil is greatest at the center of each mass of each coil. And as the concentration increases further, local fluctuations will happen less and less. Local concentrations can be taken as an average of the total system, and this is what's considered a concentrated polymer system. And then we can assume uniform polymer density at C double star, represented by this relationship here. We can assume uniform polymer density. And here, V is the excluded volume of a chain segment. Uh, B prime is the bond length of a segment of molar mass, M sub S. And in order to give a rotational flexibility used to produce a random walk, a chain segment of, of bond length B prime equals C infinity B is used. And the excluded volume is related to that chi parameter, where V is the specific volume of the polymer. And as solvent quality improves, the excluded volume increases as the chain expands. As concentration rises above C double star, we approach polymer in the melt. Thus concludes elasticity or high Deborah number measurement uh, part one, video two. Thank you.